La Nina. This is most likely not the first time you're clicking on a video about it, and within the past weeks, many people, including myself on my main channel, are talking about it. What's with the huge fuss and what will it mean for the Atlantic hurricane season of 2024? Buckle up and get ready to explore because we'll be taking a stop in the Eastern Pacific Ocean. And now you may be a little more confused. What on earth does the Pacific have to do with the Atlantic? No worries, I'll be sure to have all the answers to your potential questions in this video. So stick with me for the next couple of minutes. Let's first understand what is known as ENSO. That is an acronym for El Nino Southern Oscillation. This is a region which is a part of the equatorial Pacific Ocean where temperatures fluctuate. It's important to understand that everything on Earth's surface is connected and what happens in the atmosphere will influence what happens in the ocean. Equatorial areas of Earth are those near the equator as suggested by the name, and there's a type of wind which is always blowing, known as the trades. These winds are also called easterlies because they're always blowing from east to west. There are times when the trades are stronger and weaker in the equatorial Pacific, which will affect the temperature in the Enso region. Since the equator receives most of the sun's direct rays, it is warm all year round. But when the trade winds are stronger, that will result in warmer water at or near the ocean surface being displaced further to the west. The deeper one travels in the ocean, the cooler it gets and when that warm water is displaced, the cooler water from further depths will replace the warm water and that is a process known as upwelling. As a result, the Enso region is cooler than normal. During the summertime in tropical areas, the increase in heating helps to fuel thunderstorms. So with cooling happening in the Enso region, there is not as much fuel for them. We now want to talk about when the trade winds are weaker than normal. Since they are not so strong, there isn't much interruption as the Pacific warms, and that will help to boost thunderstorm activity. The warming and cooling that I just explained are the main phases of ENSO. The warm phase is known as El Nino, and the cool phase, La Nina. There is a third which really is the transitional phase between them both, and it is known as the neutral phase. But what are the influences of El Nino and La Nina on the Atlantic hurricane season? When El Nino helps to boost thunderstorms, there is something that happens. Those thunderstorms help to generate stronger winds further up in the atmosphere coming from the west. When strong enough, these winds interfere with tropical cyclone development in the Atlantic basin. This hindering factor is called wind shear, officially defined as the change in wind speed and or direction with height. So that is how El Nino phases typically result in a more suppressed hurricane season, by basically interfering with the thunderstorms associated with low pressure systems trying to develop or intensify in the Atlantic. On the flip side, La Nina seasons don't result in that much wind shear, so in a nutshell, La Nina typically means more activity in the Atlantic, while El Nino typically means a less active season. However, there are many other variables that will play into the hurricane season, and based on the current setup and projections, there are signals of a somewhat worst-case scenario for 2024. Let's look at these other variables, starting out with sea surface temperatures. Warmer sea surface temperatures help to fuel thunderstorm activity with increased evaporation rates, which in turn leads to cloud formation and more atmospheric instability. So we can guess that with above average sea surface temps, there's likely to be an increase in thunderstorm activity. 
Now let's take a look at this graph plotting the average surface temperature of the North Atlantic. The bold black line is for 2024 and the orange line represents 2023. We can also see many thin gray lines that represent previous years all the way back to 1981. What I want to highlight about this chart is for us to see that the bold black line has remained highest on it up until now in late March when I'm recording this video. This is something concerning because as aforementioned, warmer sea surface waters will fuel development. So when comparing the past 40 plus years, this year so far is the warmest. The next variable that we want to talk about is the Bermuda Azores High. This may sound very fancy, but it's essentially an area of high pressure in the North Atlantic. Winds blow outward from the center in a clockwise manner in the Northern Hemisphere, and it is the main steering mechanism for tropical waves and tropical cyclones originating from Africa. During both the warm and cool phase of ENSO, there are alterations to atmospheric circulatory systems, including the Bermuda Azores High. Tropical cyclones have a natural tendency to want to go north and will travel along the periphery of the high pressure area. And when there is a weakening in it, the tropical cyclones usually take that opportunity to move up and out. And that is a trend seen a lot during El Nino hurricane seasons. On the other hand, La Nina typically induces a stronger area of high pressure and thus more tropical cyclones will tend to trod west. Let's take a look at the tracks of tropical cyclones for recent hurricane seasons. 2020 is currently ranked as the most active season in recorded history that produced 30 named storms and 14 hurricanes. As we look at this map, we can see a decent density of tropical cyclones that affected areas such as the Caribbean, Bahamas, and Gulf Coast of the United States, and it was a La Nina season. The most recent El Nino season was last year in 2023, and we can see the influence it had as many storms that formed remained offshore since the area of high pressure was not dominant. The final variable we want to take a look at in this video is the Saharan air layer. It is a mass of dry, dusty air originating from the Sahara Desert in North Africa that can traverse the Atlantic and reach as far as the Caribbean and Americas. In large, dense quantities, it can significantly impact the hurricane season. Its very dry nature can stabilize the atmosphere, inhibiting thunderstorm development and, when persistent enough, it can actually act as a shield to limit how much sunlight penetrates the ocean surface, resulting in some cooling. Now you're currently looking at a precipitation anomaly forecast map from a computer model known as the Canadian Seasonal and Interannual Prediction System or CANSIPS from the period August through October, which are usually the most active months in the hurricane season. The green shadings indicate above average moisture, which means potentially more thunderstorms and inevitably more tropical cyclone activity. Notice how the green shading stretches from the African coast and into the Caribbean and Gulf of Mexico as well. The fact that above average precipitation is forecast ties together the above average sea surface temperatures and a stronger Bermuda Azores high and also suggests that there may not be as much dry air intrusion to significantly suppress tropical cyclone activity and that all ties in with what is typical of La Nina years. Now, this is not to say that every day throughout the hurricane season will be favorable for development and every tropical wave will develop. On average, there are 60 tropical waves that emerge from Africa during the hurricane season. And surely there have not been 60 tropical cyclones in one hurricane season in the Atlantic. The projections simply mean that with La Nina on the horizon, it is likely that we could see more storms than average. An average hurricane season is one that produces about 14 named storms, 
seven hurricanes and three major hurricanes. So conditions will generally favor above average development, but there will be times when tropical cyclones struggle to develop and a couple systems may loiter at sea and not be a bother for anyone. Early predictions are already calling for up to 20 named storms this year, which is concerning. But what exactly does this mean for you? The Bahamas, Caribbean, Central America, Gulf Coast, and the East Coast of the U.S. are usually prone to impacts on an annual basis. And now when it is the calm before the storm is when action is to be taken for potential impacts. It doesn't mean you will get hit this year, but since you're in the region prone to impacts, it is best to be safe than sorry. Here are a few things that we can all do. Number one, trimming large trees. We love the trees and they are so beneficial to our environment, but if they are so large that branches could cause major damage if blown down in the event of strong winds, then they're certainly a hazard, so trimming them will minimize that risk. Number two, tucking away some cash. We know the popular saying about saving some money for a rainy day, so it's good to have some tangible cash in case of any natural disaster because chances are you may not be able to swipe your card to get essentials in the aftermath. Number three, organizing important documents. It is important that your personal documents are stored in something that is reachable and waterproof. Using under the mattress is a popular Caribbean practice, but that's not exactly the safest place to keep them. And number four, having an emergency kit. Anything can happen. It doesn't have to be a tropical storm or hurricane. There could be another natural disaster and so, it is important to always have an emergency kit on standby should you need to grab and go. Some items that can be included are canned and dry food items, a radio with batteries, flashlights, first aid items such as bandages and pain relievers, personal hygiene items, and you can also keep some of that tucked away cash in there. Those are only a few of many things that can be done to prepare for the upcoming hurricane season. And another important thing to do is to keep updated on weather activity across the North Atlantic Basin, which is the purpose of my main channel, Weather Girl Danny. I upload videos every day to keep you posted on what's happening in a very timely manner. So you can go ahead and subscribe and tap the bell if you haven't done so, so that you can tune into my videos, most likely when you're having breakfast in the early mornings. Thank you so much for watching this video. And I hope that what I explained has been transparent and you learned something new. However, if you have questions wanting any further clarifications, feel welcome to post them in the comments and I'll respond to you as soon as I can. Enjoy the rest of your day and see you soon!